All right. I guess we can get started now. Um, Holly Toe, and welcome to our second session of the Choctaw Nation Historic Preservation's Tata Tsholi Virtual Speaker Series. Saho Chifuat, Megan Baker, and I'll be with facilitating Ryan's discussion today. For those of you who are new to our speaker series, um, we've called it Chata Tasholi, which means interpreter of Choctaw knowledge. It comes from the verb Tasholi, which the Byington Dictionary defines as to pour out, to transfer, to translate, to define words, or to explain. Um, so with things from help from the School of Choctaw Language, we've interpreted Choctaw Tasholi as a person who helps us understand the history and knowledge of our Choctaw ancestors. Over the course of this speaker series, we will feature Choctaw community members, artists, cultural bearers, scholars of Choctaw culture and history, and other experts. Two weeks ago, we hosted our first um, event with Dr. Christina Snyder from the Pennsylvania State University, who talked about her research on um, Choctaw Academy in Kentucky. If you missed that, we'll be releasing the video from that talk soon. Um, we're also currently in the midst of planning our summer schedule, so make sure to sign up on our listserv to stay updated in all of our events. Um, today, I'm pleased to welcome Historic Preservation's very own Ryan Spring, who has done numerous presentations on behalf of our department, some of which you might be able to find on YouTube. <laughs> Um, Ryan is a tribal member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. His family was federally removed from the Ashokwa community in the Apatakwa district in what it, to what is now today Hugo, Oklahoma. Ryan has worked in the Historic Preservation Department since 2010 as a GIS specialist and director. He currently serves as an archaeological technician. He works to assist the Choctaw community in protecting and preserving Choctaw sacred and historic sites and assist the community in its efforts to revitalize Choctaw traditional culture and history. In 2017, Ryan received his MS in Native American leadership to better serve his community. He plays for the Choctaw Nation's Tushkahoma stickball team and lives in Calera, Oklahoma with his wife, Kathia, and two nieces, Amiya and Kinsley. Um, apparently, they're in a bedroom being hidden away, <laughs> so Ryan can give his presentation. Um, so Ryan, whose webcam is out of order, um, has prepared us a brand new presentation on Choctaw place names, um, in which he'll provide us the history and stories associated with various important places for Choctaws throughout time. He's going to go through the whole kind of thing, and you can submit questions as he goes along in the chat sidebar. And then once he's done, I'll read through your questions, and we'll go through it that way. So, um, Ryan, why don't you go ahead and take it away? All right. Thank you, Megan. Appreciate it. So, I was talking with Megan and Jennifer here a couple of weeks ago about, you know, what, um, what I could possibly present on. And they were thinking, well, let's do some place names. And I said, well, that might be fun. You know, Ian and I did a place name presentation two or three years ago at a travel GIS conference um, as a keynote speaker. And I said, you know, that went really well. People are really interested in it. And I said, well, let's, let's do that. And as I started getting these place names, you know, put in, I realized there's all these stories that tie into it. And we as indigenous people, we as Choctaw people, part of our identity comes from our history, it comes from our culture, it comes from our sovereignty, but it comes from our relationship that we have with the land. And so that's something that we as Choctaws continue to do today is have a relationship with our land. You know, we name different places after different things. We have stories about areas and it's, it's just a part of who we are as Choctaw people. So today I wanted to take a look at some of the places all around uh, what I call Choctaw country, um, all across the Southeast that um, I think are pretty interesting, but also have some cool stories. So let's jump in. So around nine or 10 years ago, our office sat down and we said, we're putting all of our archaeological sites in GIS to help keep track of them and to protect them. But they said, what if we started putting in all these Choctaw place names as well? So we started doing that. 
you know, one by one, we started putting these different place names in. And what you can see today is each point represents a place name or each line represents a place name. So on this map here, you can see, I mean, if you were to guess, where's Choctaw country? You know, where have Choctaw people left a footprint on the land? And that's by how they've named the land through time. You know, we have 600 generations of Choctaw people dating back to our creation in the Southeast. And just from this place names map we threw together, you know, over the last few years, you can see, you know, our homelands in East Central Mississippi right here is the thickest part. And it spreads all around. Different people that have moved in with us through time, different Choctaw speaking people over in Alabama that moved in with us, you know, they were naming their places as well. As we started expanding into Louisiana, you can see there's lots of places in Louisiana that we started naming. And then eventually, even after coming to Oklahoma, you can start to see there's several places in Oklahoma that we made our own. And that's kind of the, the beauty of having a relationship with the land is uh, it's a two-way relationship. And I guess that's, um, that's what we're going to talk about here with some of these, these others. So the first one I want to talk about is Nanewaya. Nanewaya Mound is our mother mound. It's um, one of our most sacred places in Mississippi. Um, so the way I've organized this, as you can see right here on location, I've given you a rough location so you kind of know where, you know, where it is, these things I'm talking about. We have the English name. So in English, they call it um, Nanewaya. In Choctaw, we call it Nanewaya. And the translation for Naniwaya is sloping or leaning hill. And that represents the our mother mound in Winston County, Mississippi. What's cool about our mound and also the cave, which I'll talk about in a second, is it's a sacred place that is owned by Choctaw people. This is a place that's owned by the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. And it's special because not, not a lot of Native people own their most sacred spots. So this is something that we can go out to any day if we wanted to. It's something that we can go out and take care of if we want to. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. But what's so great about this place is the story that goes with it. And, you know, with the mound, um, but a lot of our creation stories talk about Naniwaya in it. But with the migration story, it talks about a large group of Choctaw people far to the west or far to the northwest. And for whatever reason, different stories have different reasons, but they needed to move and find a new home. So they started um, getting together, and there were two brothers that were to lead these groups. You had Chapta and Chikasa. And with them was a Hopai or um, a prophet, and he had a staff called the Iti Fabasa. And what he would do is each evening he would take the staff and strike it into the ground. And throughout the night, Ashtahli, or the creator or God, would push that staff in the direction that the Choctaw people would go that next day. And every day it went towards the east or to the southeast. So each day Choctaw people would get up and they would move in that direction. And eventually, finding their place um, in Mississippi, um, Choctaw's group and Chikasa's group got separated. Chikasa's group settled a little bit farther north, and Chikasa's, I mean, uh, Choctaw's group settled right here in Winston County, Mississippi. And to honor the creator, they built the mound, Naniwai. There's lots of different versions, and um, the, the best versions of the story are by Peter Folsom and the Choctaw Tales book by Mold um, has them both in there. 
And I think we'd be willing to share those too. If you're interested, we can share those stories with you. Um, but so, you know, this is one of our most sacred places and it's one of our greatest um, landscapes and place names that we have. Just a mile away is Nanawaya Chaluk. So just a mile away is, uh, from the mound is a natural hill. And within that hill is a cave. And Choctaw, believe, Choctaw people believe that this cave is where we were created. This is where our stories tell us that Hashtahli took this clay right here along the bank this yellow clay and made people out of it. And he created an opening. And as people started coming out, they would lay on the side of the hill and the sun would dry the clay and they would became people. And the people started marching to the east, to the northeast, to the south, all over. But the last group of people to come out decided to stay. And they called themselves the Chata. So this other story, you know, talks about how we were created here and then we built Naniwaya Mound. So this is also another beautiful place. It's owned by Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. Um, now, the reason that we have it as non Awaya. You know, some people call it Naniwaya, some people call it Naniwaya. Um, so Naniwaya means, you know, sloping or leaning hill. But if you look at Naniwaya, some of the elders have told us that that means um, like a place of growth or a cave of growth. And we say Naniwaya Chaluk. So that's why we um, translate it this way in this presentation. You know, different families and different people have it translated different ways. They say it different ways. This doesn't mean that this is the right way. This is just the way that um, I had chose for this presentation. Uh, personally, this is the way that I spell it. So after removal, Choctaw people, um, thousands and thousands of us over a period of 70 years um, were forced to come to Indian territory, what is today Oklahoma? And in doing so, one of the first things we did in 1834 is we started, um, our council got together and they started passing the laws and started getting the Choctaw Nation reorganized again. And in 1838, we built a council house at our new capital, which we called Nanewaya. And this is symbolic because Naniwaya is our home place. It's the most sacred place we have, and we wanted to bring it with us. And so we did. We came to an area, we settled there, and we named it after a place that we loved, a place that um, we always wanted to be with. There's an oral story that talks about how dirt was taken from Naniwaya Mound in Mississippi and brought to... Oklahoma. When um, when when we had an archaeologist do a survey of the Naniwaya area, and there was a small conical earth mound found there, and of course you know they didn't do any kind of intrusive digging on it, but the soil there didn't look like any soil from that particular area. So. You know, we don't know if that story is true or not, but it just shows, you know, a story like that shows that the deep rooted connection that we have with our home, that we have with our families. Also what happened is on the Trail of Tears, a lot of our families wanted to bring a little bit of their home with them. So what they did is they would bring these small eating bowls, these small ompo with them. And these bowls were made from the native clay in their area, and they've been passed down from you know, grandmother to mother to daughter. And so when people were being forced to remove and they didn't have any way to take anything, 
one of the most important things that we saw the women take were these pots. Um, so this is an eating bowl that's in the museum at Tushkahoma right now in the Council House Museum. And, you know, it, it represents taking a little bit of their home with them to where they were going. And that really shows that significance of, you know, land, the significance of that place that we have for which we love. So one of the cool, cool place names is Hacha Balbaha. It's in English, we call it the Mississippi River. So in Chata, it's Hacha Balbaha or Hacha Balbacha or Hacha Balbacha. It, um, different dialects may say it differently, but it translates to a river of foreign language speakers. And so this is pretty cool because it talks about how Choctaws understood that the Mississippi River represented many, many, many nations of diverse people that spoke different languages. You know, as we traded up and down the river, we ran into all these different people. So we understood that everyone utilized this river. So we called it a river of foreign language speakers. Um, one thing I want to note is there is a misconception that the Mississippi, the word Mississippi comes from Misha Sopokni, um, kind of like talking like an ancient river. Um, that is a misconception that's been going on for about 100 years. Um, I didn't get a chance to look it up, but the word Mississippi comes from a tribe that's much farther up on the Mississippi River. So, um, but you know, the earliest word that we had was Hacha Balbaha. This picture here is a picture that we've taken. Um, it's from our indigenous immersion camp. And we have our youth here and some of our uh, facilitators here. There's me, Ian, Deanna, Misty. And we, we always stop at the Vicksburg overlook, overlooking the Mississippi River. And, you know, to me, that's a way to look at that river and wonder what our ancestors thought every time that they got to that river. Because the Mississippi was the westernmost boundary of Choctaw people. When you hit it, you knew that you were at the edge of Choctaw country. And then I wonder what people must have thought when they were forced to load into boats or to cross that river. So um, not only the Vicksburg crossing is always something I like to stop and just kind of reflect on the, the power of the river itself, but the, the power of the, the place. If you go farther south on the Mississippi, you'll hit a place called Balbaha Tamaha. It's in Orleans Parish, and it's known as the city of New Orleans. So in Chata, it's also called um, Balbaha Asha. And it loosely translates to a place of foreign languages, just like the river. So as Choctaw people started moving into Louisiana because of settlement pressures and colonization, um, we started doing a lot of trade with the French and the Spanish and the English and the Americans in New Orleans. And we recognized all these different people from all these different places were there. And, you know, it's a great place to go to trade. It was a great place to go to learn more about the world. Um, but it's still an important place today. On the left is a picture of um, two of our youth, uh, Raven Baker and Caleb Sullivan. Um, we used to go to a reenactment down in New Orleans that the National Park Service would put on. And they would train the, our youth to become living historians so they could tell Choctaw history and the Choctaw history of the Battle of New Orleans at the event. So New Orleans is still an important place for Choctaw people today, just as it was in the past. And um, it's an interesting place, definitely an interesting place. So. So this is a this is a really cool one. It's called the Hacha Hatak. Um, this river is in both Mississippi and Alabama. Today it's known as the Tong Tom Bigby River. And some of you go, well, the Tom Bigby, that's a Choctaw name, right? It is, 
but it's not the original name for this river. Um, Tom Bigby is actually, um, it was a mistake that was made. It was a, um, uh, a mistake between uh, one of the explorers and a Choctaw speaking person. So if we start going back, we look at Tom Bigby and Tom Bigby comes from the word it Tom B, it be bulk, which means coffin maker river. And that's because, you know, there was an explorer or a trader on a boat and they asked the Choctaw person, what's the name of this river? And the Choctaw person said, oh, you know, this is Itombe Ikbe Bulk. This is where the coffin maker is. So, it, or the box maker. So that was written down as, oh, this is the Tom Bigby River. But at that time, Choctaws most likely called it the Tahomey. And that's because farther to the south, the Tahomey people used to live on this river before they joined in with um, with our bloodlines today. So the Tahomey and the Naniaba and the Moili all lived down by Mobile, but they lived along the Tom Bigby. And as they moved their way up the Tom Bigby to try to escape disease and warfare, um, they eventually uh, were adopted in by Choctaw people. But if we go back even farther, we used to call the river the Hatra Hatak, or the river people. And that's because Choctaw people used to live on this river. Um, we had Choctaw people living near Naniwai, as we've always had in time. But as our people started spreading out, a lot of them spread out to the east in Alabama. And they lived on this, on this river. On the eastern side of the river, you had what was known as the, uh, the Moundville people. Um, so one of the theories that we have is that this river was the dividing line between two Choctaw people. The people on the west side, we think may have been the, um, uh, the Imaklasha, and we think the people on the east side would have been the, um, the, you know, the beloved people and the divided people. And the river was the dividing line between them. Um, you know, we're not we're not completely sure, but um, it seems to make a lot of sense. One of the things that some elders have told us too is if you take Hacha Hatak and you put it together, um, and you say it enough, it becomes Chata. The C H A, and the H A, Chata. And so that's where it, it's one theory of where um, Choctaw comes from, is from Hacha Hatak. And that's because, you know, as, as Choctaw speakers, as we keep using a word through time, uh, we simplify that word to make it easier to say. And over time, Hacha Hatak, Hacha Hatak. Okay, so this is a really cool one. Uh, I didn't know about this one until the other day. Ian shared this one with me. Um, so there's a river called the um, Santa Bogue Creek in Washington County, Alabama. But for Choctaws, it's known as the Sinti Bolt or Snake Creek. So apparently on this river, um, a lot of Euro-Americans used to um, have stories about these giant snake bones along the river. And there were, um, back in the late 18, no, early 1900s, I'll have to go back and look, but there was these bones found, and there are bones to a, a Basilosaurus, which is this creature that you see right here. It's this long water serpentine creature. So we think that, you know, Choctaws may have seen these bones too in the past and thought it was a great serpent. And that's why they called it Snake Creek or Sinti Bolt. So uh, I think that's really cool. So this is, um, of course, I got it from Tuscaloosa Honda, but this is, uh, this is hanging up in the um, Alabama uh, Museum at the University of Alabama. So it's really cool. I hope to go see it one day. It looks really, really neat. But it was found there on uh, Santa Bo Creek. Here we go. 
So Pachi Ayata. In English, Pachuda. Chata Pachi Ayata. Translation, pigeons roost there. So in Oklahoma, um, you know, just around the Boswell area, you have a town of pigeon roost. And in Mississippi, you also have a town, Pachi Ayata, which means pigeons roost there or pigeon roost as well. Um, I think it's possible that some of the people that moved from that town in Mississippi ended up naming it after that here in Oklahoma again, too, or just because in general, there were a lot of pigeons that roost there. But what's really cool about the, when Choctaws talk about pigeons roost there, like pigeon roost, they're talking about the passenger pigeon. And that's this pigeon right now, which is now extinct. Stories talk about how the passenger pigeon could black out the sky for two to three days because there were so many of them passing. Um, they played a vital role in the southeastern ecosystem. I was looking at an article just this morning about how it's possible that the passenger pigeon was the major uh, thing that kept the tick population in check. And that's why we have so many issues with ticks today is because the passenger pigeons have also gone extinct. Um, the main environment for the passenger pigeon are river cane breaks. So as the river cane has reduced down to less than 2% today, that also explains why the passenger pigeon has gone extinct. So, uh, it's a beautiful bird. It's something that, you know, um, I wish it was still around for me and you know um, my family so forth moving on but it's it's one of those things that colonization has affected here's a cool one chisha foca chisha foca is uh, a choctaw town that used to stand where the town of jackson mississippi is today um, and Chishafoka means among the post oaks. So this is a cool thing where we, you know, we had our database set up and uh, National Park Service, um, the Natchez Trace Parkway contacted us and said, we're going to create a multi-use trail uh, and we want to name it after one of your chiefs. And we said, you know, that's great. We would love to you know, work with you. And, you know, thank you for wanting to, to, to name it after you know, a Choctaw, a great Choctaw person. But we said, you know, what if we, what if we name that trail off of the, the land that used to be there? And they said, that sounds like a great idea. So we worked with them on Chishafoka. They're in Ridgeland, Mississippi, real close to Jackson. Um, they had a, a signed dedication ceremony and that's where Joe Wolf from our office went out. And uh, I believe this is the mayor of Ridgeland. And this is the park ranger we worked with. And these were some bike, uh, bicyclists that came out to, to the event. But um, this was just a really cool thing of reclaiming our homelands. You know, through time, our lands have been, you know, the names for the lands have been rewritten over. But we have, um, today we have the sovereignty and the ability to go back and help go back to our homeland and name the things back to what we used to call them. And this is a great opportunity we had in a partnership we've had with the Natchez Trace. And I think it's, I think it's pretty cool. So for those that don't know, um, among the post oaks. Nope, I forgot. Okay, moving on. So, Okata Chitto. <laughs> Megan's laughing. Okata Chitto. So Okata Chitto is the Choctaw word we had for the Gulf of Mexico, um, which translates to a big lake. So what's fascinating about this to me is that you have this big body of water. And in Choctaw, the direction for south is Okamahle. And that means the water wind talks about the summer winds that come from the Gulf up into Choctaw country. But, you know, so if you have the Mississippi River as the Western boundary, the Gulf of Mexico would have been our Southern boundary. You know, it would have been 
you know, a huge landmark for Choctaws. But when we talk about Ocata Chito, and you talk about a big lake, to me, it makes me think, so we're not calling it an ocean. We're not calling it this other big body of water, but we're calling it a lake. And to me, what that means is that Choctaw people understood that there were, there was land on the other side of this, you know, for 600 generations, you know, Choctaw people have lived in this area and we knew that there were other people on the other side. We traded with them um, back in Mississippian times and even up until later. Choctaw stories talk about how um, there's different stories about how we got corn, but one of them is, is that um, a raven brought the corn from, from the south. And we know that archaeologically that the corn that Choctaws raised came from Central America. We know that we traded for it and started growing it later on. So I just think it's it's really cool how there's that connection in this word, Ocata Chito, and how just understanding you have a big lake, but what's on that other side and what that all means. Um, I want to give a shout out to Norma Howard. She's one of our great Choctaw artists. And this is uh, one of my favorites, uh, one of my favorite pictures that she did. Um, and this is the first thing that stuck into my mind when I was thinking of um, corn, and Choctaws with corn. Poa Tikafa. So in Kemper County, Mississippi, there's an area called Poa And that comes from the Choctaw word Poa Tikfa which is a place where wild animals have shed their hair. And what that means is that it was an area where animals would go and they would shed their hair and Choctaw women would go out there and they would collect that hair and use it to spin different fabrics and textiles. Well, the type of animal this would have come from at um, the time this place name would have been the buffalo. So, with diseases, the Choctaw population crashed quite a bit. We had a lot of deaths um, all over the United States. You know, 90% of Native people died over a period of just 100 to a couple hundred years. So with that population crash, the, um, the buffalo who were kept in check to the West uh, were able to spread as far as Florida. So what happened is during the spring, they would come to Choctaw country and they would start rubbing on a lot of the different vegetation and, and rocks and you know, all sorts of stuff that's there to help shed that winter coat off. And when they did that, Choctaw people would go out and they would collect that wool and they would spin it. This picture to the left is a picture of Jennifer Byram and um, oh, Sandra, <laughs> Sandra Riley. Uh, Sandra's a really cool cat, known her for a few years now, great genealogist, great historian, great researcher, just great all around, very centric, love it. But um, Sandra and Jennifer worked on this buffalo wool spun um, skirt to put in the cultural center. And I just thought it was a, a really cool type of thing that, you know, it's been such a long time since our Choctaw women have used this type of textile work to make something. And to me, you know, this is all kind of part of that is part of this experience was, okay, well, how do we get the wool? And so Jennifer had to experiment with all different ways of actually getting the buffalo wool from the hide. And there's a great story there of the stinky hide and Jennifer in a bucket, but we won't go into that right now. Apotaka Hacha. So in Alabama, there's a river called the Black Warrior River. And um, if you've ever been to Moundville, right there at Moundville, you can look out and you can see the Black Warrior. And it's a beautiful river. It's got some of the best clay uh, I've ever seen for pottery. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. Well, the Black Warrior River had two different names in Choctaw history, the Apotaka Hacha and Tushkalosa. Apotaka Hacha means the border river, and that's because the Black Warrior River 
was known as the eastern border between Choctaws and Creeks. So this was a very important landmark for our people, knowing that once you reach this river, um, you know, you'd be crossing into um, creek lands. But also it's really cool because, you know, the river is named after one of our greatest chiefs, Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa was a chief in the, uh, somewhere in the, you know, he was in Alabama, somewhere around the Moundville area, and he encountered DeSoto. And DeSoto had, basically DeSoto had put him in chains and took him. In exchange, he said, I'll let you go if you provide me with food, um, women as slaves, um, gold, you know, all, all the things that, the, that DeSoto and his people wanted at that time. Tushkalosa said, I will get you these things. You just have to meet me here. So a while later, DeSoto came to uh, a village called Mabila. And in Mabila, um, Tushkalosa's warriors ambushed the Spaniard. And he said, I brought you here. Here's the things you want leave. And when one of the warriors went to unbind Tuscaloosa, uh, one of the Spaniards killed that warrior. Well, that started a battle between the Choctaw warriors there and DeSoto. And as the Choctaw warriors beat um, DeSoto's men out of town, um, DeSoto's men started to retreat. Um, I think there was about 300 DeSoto's men and there was a Two to three thousand Choctaws, maybe four to five. I, I don't remember exactly, but there was quite a few thousand Choctaw warriors. But the Spanish had horses, and Choctaw warriors weren't sure how to how to fight horses. And eventually, it pushed the warriors back, and the Spanish were able to defeat the Choctaw warriors. After the warriors died, the Spanish came back into the town to. Um, take the rest of the town as slaves. But as they got to town, all the women came. They picked up the men's weapons and they came and they started fighting. And DeSoto's men were forced to kill the women. After the women died, the children came and picked up their parents' weapons and they fought to the death as well until they were all killed. So everyone in the town fought to the death. And DeSoto's people were so beat up after this battle um, it took them a month to heal before they went on and uh, got annihilated by the Chickasaws. But what's really interesting about this story is that, you know, Choctaw people would fight for their sovereignty and not become slaves of another. And the Spanish learned that they could not subjugate Choctaw people like they had others. And so that's why it took them so long to gain a foothold. Tuscaloosa, you know, was that chief and he was that warrior um, that this river is named after. This is an image that Ulan Moore has done. Uh, Ulan Moore is a modern French Renaissance painter. And this is one of the coolest images. This isn't the whole picture. It's been cropped for the presentation, but it's one of the only images where, you know, you see Tuscaloosa and he's standing his full, I mean, he was known to be tall probably 6'3", six, 6'4", six, big guy. You have all these Choctaw warriors in the background, you know, decked out in their best. And then, you know, you have the Spanish over here too. But it, you know, in a lot of Western paintings, it's always, you know, these, the Western people very being very dominating and everything. But in this one, it shows the proud and strong native warriors that they were. And uh, I think this is just a, a great image. Um, I, I, I say definitely look at Ulan's work, um, ulan.us. Ulan Moore is a great, great painter. <laughs> so this, Alba Amo. This location is Alabama. In English, the Alba Amo, we call the Alabama River. Chapta Alba Amo, probably Hacha. Or, you know. So 
and it means to gather vegetation. So the Alabama River was named after the Halbamo people that lived there. Um, the Halbamo people ended up moving in with Choctaws and we adopted them in. But um, when they were still their own entity, we called them uh, the Alba Amo or the people that gathered vegetation. Um, this picture I have over here is a picture uh, on the left is Alexis. She's one of the archeologists that we work with, with the um, Mobile District Army Corps of Engineers. And on the right is Lest Williston. He's cutting a big old piece of tulla or uh, palmetto. We have an agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers to go out every year and harvest different uh, products that we may need to teach classes with. And we actually go on the Tom Bigby River but um, so this, this image is actually more uh, along the Tom Bigby than it is the Alabama River. But I just thought, you know, that um, we as Choctaws are still going back to our homelands and gathering these different plants and gathering these different materials that we need to continue our, our cultural lives. And I just thought this is a, a great picture to use. This is a cool one, Halonlawasha. So Halonlawasha is known today as Philadelphia, Mississippi. And it translates to bullfrogs are there or bullfrog place or place of bullfrogs. Um, so there in Philadelphia is the Pearl River community for the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. Uh, this picture here is of the 2019 Holy Okchi Ishko champions. So this was the 14 to 17 year old group and they were the stickball champions that year. What's really cool about, you know, this name is it talks about, you know, the American bullfrog and how there was all these bullfrogs in this place. But, you know, it shows that this was a Choctaw village that had been there for, you know, who knows how far back in time. But today there's still Choctaw people there. They're still living there. And they still have a connection to that land and that landscape. And, you know, they're still playing their traditional game of stickball. I just thought it was a, thought it was a really cool place name and just how it tied still into Choctaw people today, just being Choctaw. So the last one I have for you all today is Tushkahoma. Um, in English, it's called Tuscahoma. In Choctaw, we call it Tushkahoma. And it translates to warriors who don't back down or retreat or an elite warrior. So when we look at these words separately, you have Tushka, which means warrior, and Homa, that means red. And so, you know, it, it does directly trans it, it does directly translate to red warrior. But when you have Homa on the end, of like Tushka or Hopai. You know, Homa is a modifier that means an elite or someone that doesn't back down, someone that won't retreat. So for Tushka Homa, the grounds were named after Chief Jackson Frazier McCurtain, who had the nickname Tushka Homa that he got during the Civil War because of his bravery in battle. And so that's what our council grounds, um, our current capital. Tushkahoma today is named after is it's named after a warrior who never retreated, but also Tushkahoma is the name of Choctaw people that won't lay their sovereignty down, no matter how hard um, colonization tries. We keep fighting back. We don't back down. We won't retreat from it, and that extends out to um, you know the term for Oklahoma. Oklahoma means the same thing. It's, it, it means people that don't back down, people that don't retreat. And, you know, when the word Oklahoma was first created, you know, that was its original meaning. It was, you know, these elite fighters. And that really says something about Native people and it says something about Choctaw people. And I think that's something that um, we need to hold on to. 
um, you know, be proud of who we are. Be proud of all the sacrifices our ancestors have made so that we can live successful and productive lives that we have today and that we can make sure that our kids have it better than we do. Um, keep our communities growing. Keep educating ourselves and keep pushing forward. Choctaw people have been around for 15,000 years. There's no reason we can't be around for another 15,000. So I appreciate everyone for listening today. Um, I had a fun time, you know, putting this presentation together. I had a fun time looking at all these place names and I hope you enjoyed them and some of the stories that they linked up with as well. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can email me at rspring at choctawnation.com. Um, you can email Megan at meganb at choctawnation.com. Um, you know, we'll be more than happy to share more of these place names. If there's um, any questions that you have, you know, reach out to us, let us know. That's, that's what we do is, you know, we're here to, to serve you, our Choctaw people, and um, if there's any gaps that you have in your history, let us know, and we can try to uh, work with you to fill those in. At the same time, we would love to hear from you, and we want to know the history of your family and um, of where you come from so that we can uh, share that and protect that information, too. But um, that's all I have for now. Um, I'll pass it back to Megan, and we'll have some, I'm open for questions for however long. Yes, thank you, Ryan, so much. So interesting, and you really get a sense of the history and the language and all the different kinds of components to it, right? There's so many things that go into a place name, and it's so complex. And so it's really good to kind of hear about these kinds of things and learn about the knowledge that our ancestors have and see how we can kind of continue it. Um, so there is the question and answer on the sidebar for those of you who are on your computers. Um, so you can go ahead and send questions. You can find, so if anyone has questions, now is the time to go with them. But in the meantime, I came up with some for Ryan. Um, and so, um, there's so many things that you kind of go through, Ryan. And so I was kind of wondering, could you maybe share how you came to learn some of these stories? Like some, how you learn, who did you learn them from? And like, or what kind of experience did you have that you came across learning these place names? Um, you know, a lot of these stories I learned from uh, Ian, Ian Thompson. Um, but a lot of them we've learned from just Choctaw community. Um, different Choctaw people that have passed these stories down. Some of them we've gotten from older ethnographic records, um, things that like Henry Halbert wrote in the past that he recorded down from Choctaw speakers. Um, so it, it comes from directly, it all comes from, you know, Choctaw people. It's just the way we come about the information, it varies. But, um, and then, you know, some of it, it, a lot of it is putting pieces together. You get a small piece here and a small piece here and a small piece here as you sift through everything. And then as you start putting that puzzle together, you can start seeing the picture. Yeah, there's so many different kinds of sources. And I feel like our department, that's one of the big things as we do is like getting information from all over and trying to synthesize it for community members. So we have a question from Gloria Ortega. She asked, what do you know about the Akolapisa Choctaw? So the Akolapisa were uh, Choctaw speaking people that lived to the um, south and uh, west of us over. Um, the Akolapisa did not move in with Choctaws. They moved in with the Tunica and the Biloxi, I believe. Um, but they were a Choctaw speaking people. Uh, but they weren't, um, they didn't amalgamate in with Choctaws. You know, maybe a few of them did, but the whole tribe didn't move in with us. Um, that's all I know on the spot, but if you have some specific questions, um, shoot me an email and we can 
definitely start uh, doing some research on it. Um, perfect. And so Terry asked, have you identified any Choctaw place names in Tennessee, Georgia, or Florida? Um, they're very scarce over in that area. Choctaw people didn't go very far into the Florida panhandle. Um, after you start hitting east of Mobile, you hit the Pascagoula people. And the Pascagoula were a Choctaw speaking people, but um, Choctaws traditionally were at war with them. So if there are any Choctaw names, it would usually belong to the Pascagoula people over in that in the in the panhandle. When it comes to Georgia and Tennessee, Choctaw people really didn't extend into Georgia at all. Um, there's a common misconception that, you know, Choctaws, you know, went as far as Georgia. And I think that comes from a lot of the records talk about how Choctaws lived in the Georgia territory. And at one time, the Georgia territory extended all the way into what we know as Mississippi today. As far as Tennessee, Choctaws really didn't expand into Tennessee either. However, the Chickasaws were there and the Chickasaws were a, um, you know, Western Muscogean Choctaw speaking people. And so there are a lot of Chickasaw place names in Tennessee. Um, Francine mentioned that she would love to see a presentation on schools, their names and places. Um, but would you happen to know anything off the top of your head right now? About hmm. schools, names and places. That's a good one. I know of a few, but that's something that Joe and I would have to tag team probably. I mean, Joseph Wolf has a lot more information on different schools and places. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, one that comes to mind that's nearby Durant is the Armstrong Academy. Of course, it was known as Choctaw Tamaha, Choctaw Town. Um, I mean, there's lots and lots and lots of place names. Um, once we get moved into the cultural center, um, you know, if anyone wants to come and stop by, hopefully we can get something put together, something interactive put together on place names in the future. But yeah, Sandra, if you have um, any particular questions, just um, come on by sometime and we can sit down and go through some of that. It's Francine, but yes. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Oh, there I go. <laughs> them again. <laughs> um, Michael Frederoff asked, have you ever been bullfrog hunting? And do you know anything about Choctaw traditional ways of cooking them? I haven't been bullfrog hunting. I've had, I've heard people do it before. It's something I've always wanted to do. Um, you know, I've, I have heard them before. I was at the, um, you know, at the Choctaw Indian Fair there next to uh, Philadelphia. And if you listen real close, you can hear in the background at the fair, Honksel, Honksel, Honksel. All right. Good I'll, get with you. I'll get with you, Mike. <laughs> Um, so Adam asked, you mentioned a man by the last name of Folsom at the beginning related to the mound. I'm a direct descendant of James and Amy Folsom. Just wondering the full name of this man and if there could be a relation. Uh, Peter Folsom. Yeah. Um, yeah, Peter Folsom did a lot of work. Um, that is something that I will... I may ask Jennifer if she knows more because I may have got the name wrong. I know it's a Folsom for sure. I want to say it's Peter, but I could be completely wrong on that. Um, I'll have to go back and look. If, if you shoot me an email, I can send you the information and we can look into it a little more. All right. So Terry wants to know, have you, he's read that there's a trade language in Mississippi um, that's in Choctaw and asks if this is true. Yeah, so in the Southeast, one of the, um, the proliferant trade language there was called the Mobilian trade language. And it was a Western Muscogean language, which means it's a Choctawoid language. But it was a simple trade language that was put together so all people in the Southeast could communicate a lot better. 
um, when it came to Choctaws and Creeks and French and the Spanish and the English and the Americans, it was used by um, everyone as, the, as that trade language. So it would have been simplified. There would have been really simple grammar to it. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, it's definitely true. And would you happen to know where the name Chattanooga derives from? Chattanooga, like in Chattanooga, Tennessee? I assume so. I believe, I could be wrong, I believe that that comes from a um, Cherokee word, but I'm not completely for sure. For sure, I'd have to do some digging on that. All right, that's all the questions I have for now. Does anyone else have questions that they want to add? Mm, I almost want to ask you to tell this Jennifer story with the bison hair. <laughs> we will leave that for now. If you come visit us at the cultural center, I will be glad to tell you about Jennifer hands deep in a nasty buffalo hide trying to get wool, well, buffalo wool off of it. Just kind of shows how fun revitalizing Choctaw culture is. It is, it is. <laughs> Terry says he was told by an elder Chattanooga translated to Choctaws live here. What do you think about that, Ryan? Yeah, I really think it's an Algonquian. It comes from Algonquian words. Um, but if Choctaws lived here, it doesn't quite translate, but I'm not a Choctaw speaking person either. So, um, yeah, like I said, email me and we'll do some we'll do some digging on it. See what we can figure out. Yes. So, for those of you don't who don't know, um, actually, one of my jobs, along with Jennifer's and Ryan, always helps us out, is to kind of do a research request. So, if you ever kind of have any like just be like oh i heard about this thing can you let us know a little bit more you can just send it our way and we can look into those things for you megan this would be a great time to talk about the program that you work for and what you do <laughs> well yeah so Je jennifer and i are part of the research associates um and we just i, I don't know that's kind of it we just do research for people what questions you have Anyone from Choctaw Nation kind of wants to learn some more about it. We kind of go through all of the many books, many articles, many ethnographic and anthropological sources to go through archaeology to kind of tell us about our Choctaw past. Yeah, that's kind of, kind of just what we do. <laughs> Catherine says, Encyclopedia Britannica says, quote, in 1838, it was renamed Chattanooga, derived from a Creek word from the nearby Lookout Mountain, meaning rock rising to a point, end quote. Okay. Um, so I guess if nobody else has some questions, we can kind of close that out for today. And you can always email Ryan, you can email me. Ryan is rspring at choctawnation.com and I'm Megan B at choctawnation.com. So um, join us in two weeks. Um, our historic preservation tribal archeologist, Dr. Kristen Wachewski and senior director and tribal historic Pres preservation officer, Dr. Ian Thompson will be in conversation with Joe Watkins, a um, Choctaw archaeologist who started the field of indigenous archaeology um, as a kind of thing. And so they will, those, they'll have a kind of panel in which they'll be talking with Joe, talking about indigenous archaeology, what is it, where does it come from, why is it important, and all of those kinds of things. Um, if you're interested in a certain kind of topic, feel free to let me know and I can see what I can line up for you. Um, as part of the Chapter to Sholi series. Again, we're coming, we're getting a lineup and we're doing this every other week. 
So we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Shipkis Balachiki.